Hey, what's up, Yvonne's? I'm back with another episode of... wine fix. I bet you're expecting $15 Friday because it's Friday. It's time for a little pause in the $15 Friday. I hope you've enjoyed them so far, but I'm bringing back weekly wine picks. I think it's important to, uh, to change it up every now and then. And as much as I was loving $15 Friday, why not do something else for a little bit? So the $15 Friday will definitely be back, but this time I'm going back to, remember this episode? I love that episode so much. I thought it was just a perfect way to introduce you guys to a couple of producers that I really love and a couple of regions and varietals that I really love. And I'm doing it again with different producers for different reasons this time. So without any further ado, welcome to season two of Weekly Wine Picks. So you may remember that last episode. If you haven't, I definitely recommend you check it out. It was a great example of two wines that you could easily bring to a dinner party for even the most discerning of wine aficionados. So there were two wines I really, really love, a Cru Beaujolais and a Dolcetto d'Alba. And I'm doing it once more, this time, with two of my other favorite producers, the Marcel Lapierre Cru Beaujolais from Morgon and the Bruno Jacosa Dolcetto d'Alba. I absolutely love both of these wines for two very, very different reasons. And as much as I love the Chateau Tivon that I did last time and the Pronoto Dolcetto d'Alba, I felt like it was important to show you that even within those two categories, there can be very different styles of these wines. I will tell you straight up, these are gonna be a little bit more difficult to find than the other ones will, but totally worth the search. And to me, sometimes that's really kind of a fun thing to do in the wine world is to kind of go on a hunt looking for wines that you wouldn't normally be able to find. And when these wines come out, I put it on my radar and I am sure to look out for them. So this wine here is a Kermit Lynch import. So anywhere that carries Kermit Lynch wine, Wines should typically have them. I will tell you wine.com doesn't have this wine any longer and that is because there's just not enough of it to go around um, and they just I guess they're just not getting their allocation of it. Every now and then I do see the Bruno Jacosa on the wine.com website but again this is another wine that's gonna be a little bit more of a hunt and search so definitely go to your local wine shop talk to them see if they've got either of those producers and uh, then we can take it from there. So without any further ado, let's jump into the 2016 Marcel Lapierre Morgon Cru Beaujolais. And if you're looking at this top right now and you're like, I don't understand, what is this red stuff? Um, this is just hardened wax. So for those of you that don't know how to deal with hard wax, it's very, very simple. If it is an older bottle, what you're gonna wanna do first is chip off that wax take. I usually use the back of my wine key, just kinda chip it off. Um, for those of you that have had old Dunn How Mountain wines, you'll notice it has the wax top as well. The reason I will chip it off first for older bottles is because a lot of times I'll need to use an also, so I'll need to actually go in um, because the cork is a little bit soft, it might break, so I get the wax off first. But in this case, it's a young bottle, so I'm just gonna dig right into it. And all you're gonna do is grab your wine key, a regular wine key, open it up, and you're just gonna dig right into the top of it. Um, and usually the wax is soft enough that you can just dig right in. You don't need to peel it off. You don't need to do anything crazy. You just dig right into the cork as if it weren't there. Just pull. And you'll see it just kind of breaks right off. It's very, very easy. If you do want to go ahead and get the wax off of there beforehand, you can absolutely do that using your wine key. And then what I'll do after, if there's a little bit of residual wax, I'll just take my knife, cut around the top, get all the rest of that wax because what I don't want is the wine to pass through this I don't want any like wax pieces so I'm very careful to make sure that I don't get it out and a lot of times I will just take the wax off immediately but in this case I don't really think it is so so necessary so all right sniffing the cork make sure I don't get any signs of TCA. If you guys wanna know more about corked wine, how to detect TCA in a bottle, make sure you click the link above to the video that I did about corked wine. Um, so out of habit, I always smell the bottom of the cork just to make sure that I don't get any sort of whiff of anything funky going on. And in this case, I don't, it's nice and clean. So let's get into the wine. You'll notice I don't even have a spit cup for this because I'm probably gonna drink it. It's really, really delicious. This is one of my favorite, favorite, 
favorite bottles of wine, not just in style, but producer. I just love this wine. What is Cru Beaujolais? Cru Beaujolais is a wine made from the Gamay grape from a particular crew within the region of Beaujolais. So in this case, that crew is the Morgon crew. Before when I did the last episode on this, it was the Brouy, B-R-O-U-I-L-L-Y, I think, um, from Chateau Tivan. Now Beaujolais is a region within the region of Burgundy in France. And for those of you who know anything about Burgundy, you'll know it is a very, very, very expensive region. There are hardly any deals to be found there. Land is very expensive, wine is very expensive, and it's just very difficult to find anything with any sort of value from the region of Burgundy. This Cru Beaujolais is an excellent alternative to a Burgundy wine, a wine that is made in a similar fashion that's light bodied, high acid, sort of like a Pinot Noir, but it's got a little bit more fruitiness to it. It's got a little bit more ease and it doesn't need to be aged for nearly as long as a red Burgundy would need to be aged for. So the producer here is Marcel Lapierre. He is considered one of the greatest producers of Cru Beaujolais. Now why is this different from Beaujolais Nouveau? So Beaujolais Nouveau, like we talked about when Beaujolais Nouveau came out, comes out once a year in November. It is a wine made from this same grape. It is still made from Gamay, but it's made using a fermentation method called carbonic maceration, which means the grapes basically are put in a vat and they are left to explode on themselves. After it goes through fermentation, it's bottled, it's capped, and it's meant for early consumption. This is completely different. This is very different from Beaujolais Nouveau. It does not go through carbonic maceration, and there's a longer aging process involved in how this wine is made. And it took a lot of time for these wines to start getting the appreciation that they deserved. A few producers in Beaujolais really wanted to give a little bit more love and attention to these wines. And as a result, a lot of people started paying attention. And now, Cru Beaujolais is considered sort of the darling of the sommelier world. It's, it's the wine that we usually gravitate towards on a list when the wines can be very expensive and we don't want to spend a lot of money. Um, you can usually find these wines on a list anywhere from between $50 and $100 a bottle. And sometimes there are special cute that will cost a little bit more. Sometimes there are special wines, special producers that will cost a bit more, but by and large, you can usually find these wines at a very reasonable and accessible price. And what I love about this is it's I, it's kind of like a little baby Burgundy. It to me, it tastes like um, a young version of a great Burgundy wine that doesn't need a lot of age. It's got a lot of finesse and it's got a lot of fruit and it's got a lot of acid and it's very food friendly, but without the cost. This wine right here is about $30, $35, depending on where you buy it. Um, some places don't don't charge quite as much. The wine has gone up significantly in price in the last few years because people have started to catch on um, and the wines have gotten a little bit more expensive. I actually haven't tried this 2016 yet. I'm very excited to try it. So let's get into the wine. Oh, it's bready. <laughs> I love these wines so much. Woo! Awesome. A lot of people ask me what my favorite wine is and what the wine I most often buy for myself and order for myself is. And if I had to answer that question, I would usually put this first and this second. This is just an absolute favorite of mine. I think for the money, you cannot do any better. And the 2016 version of this definitely does not disappoint. I'm very excited. So I will say this wine, I noticed in the 15 vintage had a little bit of Britannomyces, a little bit of Brett. Um, so it has a little bit of funkiness on the nose. So it definitely had in the 15 vintage. It has a tiny bit on the 16 vintage. Now what is Brett? I'm sure you're all wondering if you don't know what it is. Brett is that kind of funk that you get in a wine. It's not to be confused with cork taint or TCA. Um, it's completely different. It's something that gives the wine a little bit more of that like earthy barnyard, uh, just kind of like, some people call it like old world funk. I really like it in small doses. I don't like when a wine is very, very bready. So if you've ever had like a really old Chateau Neuf de Pop, like a Chateau Rias, you've probably noticed that it does smell a little bit like barnyard. It smells a little bit like horse manure sometimes. I know it comes kind of gross, but that is Brett. And it's just something that's naturally occurring in the wine that happens every now and then. Um, and there is a little bit of Britannomyces present. So this isn't as clean and bright and cranberry as like the Chateau Tivan was. It's, uh, it does have a little bit of that funk on the nose. On the palate, it doesn't carry over so, so heavy, but by and large, you can definitely expect these wines moving forward, I think, to have a little bit of Britannomyces on them. So if you don't like that, I think this is probably gonna be a little bit more up your alley. But in the meantime, if you do like a little bit of funk, a little bit of, I think it gives the wine character. I think it's really interesting. It's got, it adds a little bit of a nuance that you don't always get with a young wine. So on the nose, I'm definitely getting a little bit more of that funk, but I'm also getting a ton of fruit, a little bit of cranberry, 
because this is an old gold wine, um, the fruit is not on the ripe side. It's actually airing the side of being slightly underripe, a little bit sour, more of that like cranberry, sour cherry kind of nose. But it's still very pretty. It has like a really lovely floral quality to it. So it, even though it has that funk, there is sort of an, an elegance to this wine. Mm. And then on the palate, it's got this beautiful, beautiful light to medium bodied weight. The Brett kind of carries through a little bit. It's a little tiny bit funky on the palate. I think that's a good thing, but I will say there is a lot of fruit on this wine in a very, very good way. So if you are somebody that loves old world res, if you love Burgundy um, and you've never had Cru Beaujolais and you're out and you don't want to spend a ton of money, this is such an awesome wine to bring to a party, to serve to guests. It's a really easy, pairable wine. It goes with a lot of different things. Treat this just like you would a Pinot Noir. It's got a light body like a Pinot Noir. It's got a little bit of that cherry. It's got a little bit of that spice. It's got great viscosity. It's got really great texture and it's got really great acid. So it's an incredible food pairing wine, but it's also very easy to drink on its own. I also really love Cru Beaujolais with a bit of a chill. I would highly recommend putting this in the refrigerator for at least 30 to 45 minutes. Take it out, open it, let it breathe for a few minutes and then serve it and it's going to be it just the right temperature, I think. Okay, let's get into the next wine. So obviously these are two wines that you've heard me talk about before. You know how much I love Cru Beaujolais, you know how much I love Dolcetto. I was very excited to bring you two different producers that I haven't introduced to you before, and I'm very excited to bring them to you now. So now we're doing the Dolcetto Daba from Bruno Giacosa 2016. All right, so, Dolcetto Daba, why do I love Dolcetto Daba? Well, to me, it's such a great way to experience great producers at a fraction of the price. If you know anything about Italy, if you're an Italian wine lover, you've surely heard the name Bruno Giacosa. He is synonymous with the region of Piedmont for making beautiful, intense, age-worthy Barolos and Barbarescos. Um, so the Dolcetto Dalba to me is a great example of a wine from a brilliant producer that is found at an accessible price point that can be consumed early, is easy to find, and is just freaking delicious. So let's get into the wine. Much more dark and brooding on the nose, a little bit even um, has like a little bit of that savory quality to it. It's got a lot of herbaceousness to it. No funk. If you didn't, if you are not into the funk, the Brett that existed on the Lapierre, this is going to be your wine all the way. There is absolutely no funk or anything weird happening here. This is all fruit, um, but still old world wine. So on the sour side, doesn't have as much ripeness. Definitely erring on the side of being slightly underripe, a little bit more restrained, and definitely has more of those earthy components to it on the nose too. It's got a brightness to it though. It's a little bit rosy. It's a little bit floral on the palate. It's a little bit fuller body than the Lapierre is. It's got a little bit more tannin, a little bit more edge, a little bit more of that drying feeling. With time, that will start to mellow out. You're not gonna get so much of that um, if you leave this open, but it definitely can stand up to some heavier food, especially if you're gonna be barbecuing, if you're gonna be doing steaks on the grill, this is gonna be the better wine to pair with that. Um, on the palate, very, very similar to the nose. It's dark, it's brooding, it's got really nice, big, rich red fruit, um, but it's still on the medium-bodied side. It's not a full, full-bodied wine. It has a little bit of restraint to it. Just to break this down really quick for you guys, Dolcetto is the grape, means little sweet one. Dolcetto d'Alba means the Dolcetto of Alba. Alba is a region within Piedmont, within Italy. It's in Northern Italy. It's a region known for Barolos and Barbarescos, age-worthy wines that need a lot of time, a lot of decanting. These wines are meant to be consumed in their youth. You don't need to age these wines. They're fantastic right out of the gate. They're meant to be consumed young. They're meant to be drunk with really easy, kind of rustic fare. Why these wines are like and why they're different, both wines are two of my favorite value wines. You can do absolutely no better than these two wines when it comes to great producers in great regions, making great wines with great integrity. There really isn't any better that I can suggest to you. If you're going to a dinner party where you want to bring a wine that is just fantastic, but you don't have a lot of money to spend, these wines will knock it out of the park, guys. I am telling you, if I were to receive either of these bottles, I would be so psyched that somebody had the thought and the foresight to think of these two wines. They are just fantastic. Even though they're only $25 or $35, there really is no better than you can do in this price bracket. I just, I truly feel that way. So just to kind of compare and contrast, a little bit lighter bodied for the Morgon, a little bit of that funk on the nose. This will be the wine that you bring for the guy that was just in Burgundy, for the girl who just loves 
Gervais Chambertin, who loves Jambo Musigny, that's having you over for dinner and that has a great palate. Grab this wine, this is awesome, she's gonna love it. If you are going to a person that has just visited Italy, they've got a ton of Italian wines in their collection. They love Brolos, they love Barbarescos, they love Super Tuscans, they love high acid wines, they just love wine in general. You've got 25 bucks to spend. Bruno Giacosa, Dolcetto Daba, this is gonna be your wine all day long. I just, I don't know why more people don't buy these wines. I don't understand. I think, you know, outside of our little sommelier community, people don't necessarily recognize these wines for what they are, and they are just so fantastic. I think I'm gonna go home tonight and make um, a nice big dinner for myself because now I've got both of these wines open and I love them so much. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I am looking forward to bringing you more weekly wine picks. If there are things you want me to talk about, if there are varietals or regions or producers that you are curious about, please do put them in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you all next time. Bye.